I'd like to start with a poem. <coughs> Diet. It was the starch and dextrin in adhesives that attracted them to Bruce Chatwin's What Am I Doing Here? Glue, book bindings, photographs, plaster, sugar and dandruff are what silverfish live off. Flickering across delicious Axminsters, they would sample 200-year-old paint. In times of famine, they'll make do with linen and silk, digest shoes. I've watched Guernsey carpet beetles swallow wool, fur, feathers and skin. Clothes moths shimmer all winter in my great uncle's sofas. His idea of pest control is to keep his tweeds in the freezer while he's sunning himself in Andalusia. Like most pests in historic houses, excluding members of my own family, they can go up to a year without food. Take the common book louse, for example. It'll devour each page of a stray novel until alone with the title, then chew its way through the covers, savouring every word. Those were my school holidays, reading in old houses, silverfish nibbling my feet. <laughs> well, I wanted to share this poem with you because it's closely linked to a journey that I've been on with my voice. A week before I wrote the poem, I found myself lying on the red and blue patterned carpet of the whiskey bar of the Stromness Hotel, up on Orkney. The hotel looks out over to Scarpa Flow on one side and to the Hoy Hills on the other. Not that I could see any of that from the floor of the whiskey bar with its 54 different varieties. Yes, I counted them all. <laughs> uh, when I opened my eyes, um, above me I saw the head of a 17 and a half stone stag that had been shot on the uh, 11th of October 1912. And Kristen Linklater, the voice coach, was thumping my chest. And she wasn't trying to revive me. It was 9.15 in the morning and I hadn't touched a drop of whiskey. So what was I doing lying on the floor? While I was sighing with relief, I was taking my breath down to my pelvis. I was feeling my breath in my body, in my hips, in my chest, in my cheeks and enjoying that resonance, and I cried. I cried because in speaking my poems from the floor, I was finally allowing out all the emotions that I'd very carefully held in check for years, and keeping them in had taken an enormous amount of energy. And I also cried because I'd been told in school that I would never get up on the stage, I would never be able to speak on the stage, I was far too quiet to speak on the stage. And I believed that for a long time, until I realised that something could change that. That actually, I could change that myself. So it was a relief to meet Kristen Linklater and to discover that I had a choice. I could either continue to intone my poems in the same dull, monochrome way that I'd been doing for years, or... I could engage with and speak using the full range <coughs> of human emotions that are available to me through my voice. Happiness, fear, anger, sadness. I sighed with relief to think that I could allow myself to mean what I'd written in my poems, that I could take away the wall that I'd put between myself and the poems. It was exciting to think that I had this choice, but of course, it was also scary. It was very scary to be honest with myself and scary to be honest with an audience. Well, before that, um, I had what might be termed the poetry voice, which has been uh, described by Kate Calloway in The Guardian on the 1st of August this year as that wistful sing-song that has become chronic at poetry readings. <laughs> she goes on to say, so many poets would benefit from the attention of a really good theatre director. <coughs> My particular pet hate, she notes, is the way that poets meaninglessly turn the last words in the line upwards, 
like a question that did not need to be asked. <laughs> and all that was true of me. But I wanted to be able to give more of myself away through my words, through my poems. So I hunted round on the internet to see who might be able to help me do this. Who could show me what it might be like for my voice to let go of all the external controls I have in place when I read and instead to explore another part of me. And I came across the name of Kristin Linklater. So I headed up to Orkney and on day one of my sessions with Kristin, I read her a sample of the poems from a manuscript I was putting together titled Banjo, which looks at the way music and the theatre um, enable the crew members of three Antarctic expeditions to survive. Don't you care about these characters, Samantha? She said to me. I thought, well, yeah, of course I do. But obviously that wasn't coming across in my voice. I was giving the impression that I didn't care enough about my characters. One of the key things that I've learned is to be as convincing on the stage as on the page. And that one way of doing this is by not anticipating the ending in my voice. Not to give away the end of the poem, not to comment on the poem in my voice, but instead to live the narrative word by word, to live the narrative image by image, to be fully present in the poem as I read it, as I speak it, and in some ways to relive the poem. Well, this was all new to me, and I had a shock when I read my poem, Curtain Call, to Kristin to realise that it just wasn't having the impact um, that I had intended when I wrote it. I was declaiming it in mournful tones um, because it tells the story of how the crew of the Terra Nova had to shoot their horses before they headed south across the ice barrier. I thought, well, it's supposed to be tragic and sad, isn't it? So shouldn't I read it like that? And Kristen said, well, no, it's actually a series of ups and downs. That, in fact, there are moments of joy in the poem, and that the first few lines are full of excitement, of the excitement of discovery, of testing things out, of fun. And it's only after the first eight lines that the difficulties start to show. Mightn't it be more interesting for my audience, I considered, if I were to be alive to those changes in the poem? Wouldn't that be more convincing? I discovered that the way to do this is to breathe in each image and to speak them out one at a time, being emotionally true in my voice to each image. And that I can do this if I allow my voice access to the deepest part of me, to my solar plexus, which is the largest single transmitter of emotion in the body. So uh, here's my poem, Curtain Call, which I first worked on with Kristin up on Orkney. We've been taking it in turns to undo our shirts in minus 70 to nurse Oates's frostbitten foot on our breasts. Jokes in the tent are discouraged since even laughing hurts. Yesterday, I threw a cup of boiling tea into the air to see it freeze before it hit the ice. If I breathe near a sheet of my diary, the pencil slips across its polished page as if I'm writing in a book of glass. Our clothes crackle like suits of armour. We have to play the game of statues to hear each other speak. The hardest part so far was ruffling the mane of each pony before we shot them on the barrier. Every night, our sleeping bags solidify to slabs of granite. So instead of rattling along and anticipating the ending in my voice, 
I began to explore what might happen if I were to hand over my voice to the intelligence of my spine. Speaking it, speaking my poems vertebra by vertebra on the floor from my tailbone as if each vertebra were a word in a sentence. And I began to feel my voice on my lips, to feel all the reverberations in all my bones and to allow my body rather than my brain to indicate where the emotionally informed emphases in the poem come from. Well, Kristen encouraged me to speak with colour in my voice, and I love this idea that my voice could change colour, that I might be able to paint the ceiling purple, the back wall yellow, um, spatter the floor with green and red dots. Allow yourselves to speak using all two and a half octaves from your speaking range, all those tones and colours and emotions in your voice, because what happens is that what you're saying comes alive as if you're saying it for the first time. And I think that this applies not only to poets and <coughs> writers and public speakers, but to all of us who open our mouths and have conversations every day, which is probably pretty much everybody in this room. Instead of flattening out all the emotion from your voice, invest time and energy in getting to know it, because it can change the way you share what's important to you with others. It can enable you to be and sound more engaged with your friends, your family, your colleagues, whether you're a poet or a scientist, a fisherman, a farmer, or a student, or a schoolgirl. I'd like to end with uh, a poem about another journey, <coughs> which looks at um, the story of Madame Tussaud, who spent several years travelling round with her exhibits before she finally settled in her museum in Baker Street. On the road. <coughs> the thing you'd think she would have been good at was sitting still. But Madame Tussaud spent 36 years touring the country in a horse-drawn cart, packed with wax effigies of the nearly dead, the long dead, and those whose heads were freshly off the block. Hers was both travelling newspaper and a show whose cast stayed motionless at all her gigs. Alone, but for her set of replicas jolting at every pothole, she'd take each face between her hands and kiss it sweet goodnight. In Leicester, Sheffield, Inverness, give talks on wax. The facts don't model outside. For those who'd fallen out of favour, she'd chisel off their heads. In Marylebone Road, right now, people are standing in lines to pay to file past people standing in lines who've been dead for years, but made to look alive. To make the dead appear living, the living dead, without quite meaning to, is a skill I can't yet take in, and one that started life in death masks where she'd reanimate the guillotine. <coughs> Before I go, did you know Madame herself was shipwrecked once off the west of Ireland, and all her wax companions dived wide-eyed to the seabed, only to pop to the surface one by one as the vessel rotted away and startle the fish who thought this lot already dead. <laughs>